Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Sales Syndicate Podcast. We're going to be talking about the importance of cutting your teeth cold calling today um, in, uh, uh, in its own right, but also in its relation to the journey from BDR to AE, um, which is more specific to my guest today, Patrick. Um, I'm going to hand over to him to introduce himself and the company before we get going. Uh, so over to you, Patrick. Hi, Jamie. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having, having me on. Um, yeah, as Jamie mentioned, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm an account executive at Revolut Business, um, sort of providing an alternative to the high street banks for, for companies. Um, I imagine most people will have heard of us um, for like you get a Revolut card if you're going on holiday, for example. Uh, but yeah, over the last couple of years, we've tried to expand the business operations. Hence, here I am. And um, in terms of your year so far, I know we've had a couple of chats over the past um few months you, you, you've had a good year so far haven't you yep yep so um for for fy23 hit two targets out of two um i've got a month just under a month left of q3 um and hopefully the target will mop itself up in the next day or so um q3 is traditionally our quietest so to come out of that unscathed is actually uh is pretty good going um for all concerned really um and so it's and it'll be my first ever time that i've hit four quarters in a row uh, which I'm, which I'm really pleased about. Yeah, I, 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 I mean that's that's a massive, um, massive result generally in sales, but especially in the market we've been in since, uh, well, probably for the last year, eighteen months. Um, it's, it's even more of a result. So I think, um, yeah, it's going to be good to um, get a few of the the tips, tricks, and hear a few of the stories you've got um, oh, yeah, no, over the next sort of forty five minutes. Uh, if the results are that good, anyway. Yeah, my. Um... I say it like that because my sales career sort of began just before COVID began. And obviously the majority of it has been in either lockdown or out of the back of that. Um, so yeah, that how, how much things have changed. And I guess the topic of today's conversation is even more relevant to how much things have changed from in selling in general, but cold outreach as a whole has changed so much in the last like four years. Um, I think, yeah, to come out of to come out of COVID, hitting four targets in a row is um, is something of which that I'm I'm really proud, um, and hopefully I can carry on. And I, I guess before we um, jump into the topic of uh, cold calling and the journey from BDR to A, it'd be good to understand a bit more about um, your journey, uh, you know, overall bro broadly, mm -hmm. um, in terms of like your sales career. So, do you want to just give us a bit of a um, a rundown of that? Yeah, of course. So my first job out of uni was actually an account executive role. Uh, so a closing sort of full cycle role for a big tech reseller, um, massive company, 15, like 15 offices, billion plus turnover. Um, and obviously you're learning on the job um, as an account executive straight out of uni. Um, however, I feel that my sales career was somewhat in reserve, reverse because my next three roles after that, um, we're all sort of BDR function. Um, and had I had that experience of being a BDR before going into an account executive full cycle, um, I feel that I would be more successful, definitely, uh, because the skills that I picked up from just pure, pure outbound outreach on the phones all the time um, have been invaluable in this role that I'm in now. Um, so yeah, I've sort of bookended my sales career, if you like, so far with account executive roles with BDR, BDR function in the middle. Um, if I'd done it the right way around in inverted commas, um, I feel like, you know, I would have been more successful starting off. But, you know, we've all got to end up somewhere. And uh, this, is how I've, this is how I've done it. Yeah, and I guess that's sort of what we're saying, isn't it? The, in the, the, it's incredibly valuable to have that um, well, cold calling, but also just, the, the the role in general as as a BDR learning the the ropes um, before progressing up up the food chain uh, let's say a hundred percent because I think as a BDR realistically you're only talking to decision makers for a small amount of time you might not necessarily as an as an account executive when you're more like you're further down the sales cycle um, you may have to involve you know sort of the wider stakeholder team in the company that, in which you're trying to sell to. Um, but as a BDR, you're literally just talking to that decision maker um, or invariably someone who reports into that decision maker. So you learn so much more about maybe the challenges that a business faces, but also what makes a business tick, what's important to them. Um, I mean, lots of companies have a, a split BDR and account executive function, don't they? Um, 
at Revolut, we're just full cycle. So I do, I do all the cold calling, all the closing, um, all the demos in the middle. But I feel that in the BDR functions that I've worked in, where I've sort of introduced account executives into those, those key stakeholders, those decision makers, um, I've learned so much more about what a company does and what makes them tick um, than I possibly could have done if I just stayed in that first account executive role and never, and never did any pure, pure BDR work. Now we've seen, um, I was having a conversation last week about, um, like the, the return of full cycle sales reps. And it, it does kind of feel as if, uh, that over segmentation of having like outbound SDRs, inbound SDRs, um, account executives all doing slightly different things. It does feel like the full cycle rep is coming back in full force where you kind of be required to do everything. Um, and I, and I think for those that have only done one thing, whether that's, you know, say you're an inbound rep who has never done cold calling, I think it's going to be a, an interest in 12 months. Yeah, I think certainly given like, obviously you mentioned how difficult the climate is at the moment, like for, for any companies, but tech companies are, are no exception. Um, that segmentation may, may diminish, it may stop. Um, but obviously with the larger, like the more enterprise style softwares for example you're saying so i've worked as a bdr for an for an erp company before these are enormous projects encompassing like hundreds of thousands if not sometimes millions of pounds like years like a year sales cycle um and in that company in those types of companies the bdr function is very distinct from the account executive function um it works for them because the projects are so enormous but certainly i think for sort of the more mid-market SMB space, maybe even up to enterprise, I don't know, I couldn't say. Uh, I think that that segmentation will will probably diminish um, as time goes on, as full cycle AEs become more prevalent. Uh, they'll have to do the stuff that BDRs have to do. Like they won't just be able to turn up to meetings having had a five minute brief from their BDR or their SDR beforehand. They'll have to do the whole thing. And those that haven't necessarily done the BDR function themselves won't be exposed because they're obviously good enough to be in the job that they're in. But I think that they will have a, an appreciation for the work that goes on sort of in the BDR corner of the sales floor for argument's sake. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a, um, an A back in the day. Um, and I always, I'll, I'll never forget what he said. He, we were on the phone with him and he said, Oh God, how, how am I meant to find the time to build my own demos? Like, I, I, like, I, I don't have time to prospect. All, like, all, all I've got time to do is, is demos. And we were sat there like people in the UK were like, well, we're booking our own demos. I don't know, I don't know what you're doing with your time. Um, yeah, it, it definitely does feel as if, um, more has been expected, um, from sales reps. Um, more skills as well uh like it's it's a it feels like it's a lot more of a um profession to get into rather than it just being that like weird segue from university before you actually find the job that you did your degree for sort of thing i mean 100 percent. like i mean i've got a law degree and i realized probably about two thirds into that that the, the last thing i wanted to be on this entire planet was a lawyer um so sales as you've just sort of like like sort of alluded to was sort of felt like a natural place to go. Um, would it, did I think at the time that it would be sort of a stop gap until I sort of sorted myself out and realized, oh no, I want to do something else. Um, but no, like it's a full, like a full time, like application of your skills, managing your time to do the BDR and the closing function at once. Um, I think that people who can do it get, get under under praised if you will because that full cycle like it, it requires a lot of discipline it requires a lot of skill um and it requires like a lot of work while some people may say that sales is not necessarily difficult because you know it's not a science you can get lucky i feel like if you're not doing the work you don't get the luck um i could say something something cheesy like a quote, quote from titanic but i'm not going to do that um but yeah, I think it's massively under-respected. Um, and I mean, as, as, as the sector grows or shrinks and grows and shrinks, um, the respect for that, for the role will, will only increase. Oh, we, we post a lot of content um, about cold calling uh, on LinkedIn. And it, as you can imagine, it's a pretty uh, divisive um, t topic in terms of people loving it, hating it. So it, in this uh, modern B2B buying you know 
journey that we're, we're in nowadays where it's like heavily digitized and there's digital sales rooms and things like does um cold calling still have as much of a place as it yeah. as it did before i really really and i and i know you're probably gonna hate this answer i really think it depends uh, i know that's like an absolutely useless answer to give to, to a question like that um but i will i will i will quantify it um so i probably split my outbound methodology if you will it's about 60 40 between like non-calling and calling outreach um it used to be a lot more heavily weighted towards co towards calling um but as you have you as you rightly say things have changed like you see decision makers in bit like from reasonably sized businesses getting lots of interactions on linkedin for argument's sake complaining that they've been persistently cold called by a rep for argument's sake um and they like the, the perception might be that a connection request on linkedin for argument's sake is sort of a better segue to ask for permission to pitch if you will however having said that the biggest deals that i've closed since joining revolut have all come from a cold call they've all come from me getting through a gatekeeper and and bargaining for time and and pitching someone over the phone um now don't get me wrong i'm not that's just that's just how it's happened for me as i said sales is not a science cold calling and outbound outreach is not a science um but i feel that the joust that can happen over a cold call like the objections that you can handle live rather than necessarily waiting for i don't know a day two days whatever it happens to be for a reply to a linkedin message or an email um can build that credibility there and then it puts a voice to the name um people are suspicious it's 2023 if a random person reaches out to me on social media that's not linked in trying to sell me something, I immediately think it's some kind of like scam or phishing or whatever. Um, so people are naturally more suspicious because of the the way that the the, the cyber security world is going, for argument's sake, um, and how people are more protective over their data, things like that. Being able to, as I just said, like live handle objections, sort of live handle a brush off, which we'll probably go into more detail on what the difference between those two things are at some point um really does instill that credibility with your with your prospect um and if you can win the joust or win the battle on the initial cold call and, and book that demo um or whatever your next stage in your sales cycle is um you'll i personally i've always had much more success in closing larger deals off the back of a cold call yeah no, no it's, it's it's an interesting one because even though your answer like you said was um sort of it, it depends. I think um, I would be a great example of that. It depends, right? I never answer cold calls. And if I get cold emails, I'll 99% of the time just delete them. Like I, I'm a marketer and they're notoriously hard to sell to. So mm -hmm. I'm like in that camp of probably impossible to sell to, probably not worth cold calling me. But then I sit next to our sales team who have a lot of success in um, cold calling. So mm -hmm. I'm very much on the fence of like, I can see its value, but don't bother trying with me. It's just not going to work. So yeah, no, I, I can I can appreciate that. I think definitely, like as a as a sales professional, um, and someone who has been in the, the the cold calling trenches, if you will, I've I've sat in a bank of desks with call figures on the wall, um, you know, a hundred 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 minutes on the phone or one hundred and fifty dials a day or whatever it has to be. Um, so I understand, like, for, if I get like a cold call from a recruiter, for argument's sake, which I mean, obviously the world is full of them the world's full they're, they're a sales professional just like me nine times out of ten i will give them the time just because i know that if i was on the phone having an absolutely dreadful day the one thing that could change that around would be a good conversation with someone even if nothing comes out of it uh because in a a cold calling first role it can get it's, it can get tough like if you're making 150 dollars a day um 50 percent don't answer uh twenty percent brush you off and the other thirty percent give you an absolute bollocking down the other end of the phone. Um that one for that one person that answers the phone, whether it's your penultimate call of the day, your last call of the day, and has a genuine like human conversation with you, can change your whole week. Um so for me I'm a bit of a sucker based on that. Like I mean I 
I, I, to be fair, I've always been like it on a like if we went on a lads' holiday to Ayanapa, I talked to literally every rep on the strip. Like, oh no, mate, sorry, no, I'd lo- I'd love to come in, but we're just going somewhere else. Um, so if anyone wants to call, call me just for a chat. Probably feel free. I mean, you've probably got my data from somewhere anyway, because as as I would, so no problems there. Well, there you go. You're going to get a, a barrage of phone calls <laughs> after this, um, but you only got yourself to blame. But uh, you you spoke about a couple of the. Um some of the the benefits of cold call there but i think that we're going to run through um some of the key like skills or benefits um or skills that you'd learn and benefits of cold calling in mm-hmm. in, in terms of developing you as a, a, a as a sales professional so um i don't know where you wanted to start but i feel like you touched on problem solving and resilience in the last like couple of minutes so i think yeah. that maybe let's, let's start with that so you know day one you're fresh into this role yeah. and you're, you're tasked with doing 100 minutes a day or 100 150 cold calls you get, you're going to get a lot of no's mm-hmm. so i guess that's probably the uh the best place to start would be the uh the, the, the no's that you get and what what that what that does to you in terms of um development yeah i mean it's it's hard right as i said like my, my first day on the set on the sales floor that i've just described with the call not the call numbers and the minutes on the wall um that was my my second job out of this account executive role which in which i in which i'd obviously gone straight out of uni to i'd had reasonable success i left during covid as lots of people changed jobs in lockdown um and yeah went from a completely different environment which was a sort of more 360 your time is your own to close your deals to this pure bdr booking meetings for someone else function um where if your if your handset is not in your hand or you're not speaking into your microphone um all of the red light isn't flashing on your on your handset for your boss to see that you're on the phone um it's sort of like what are you doing um and my first sort of proper morning on the phones was about 3 days into the job um I was faffing around trying to find the next person to call manager pulls me aside takes me down the road for a coffee and goes what are you doing um, like we've hired you into this job because you interviewed well and we want you to succeed, but you have to be on the phone to do that. Um, and that was the biggest kick up the backside that I possibly could have got at that time. One that I wasn't necessarily expecting, given it was my first day on the phones. Um, but yeah, I had just had to do it. And the easiest way to get comfortable with getting a no is to get lots of them. Uh, I know that sounds probably quite straightforward, but the only way that you're going to learn how to come out of the other side of a dreadful day, morning, week on the phones is to pick it up. Um, We were targeted, I think it was like book 12 meetings a month or something like that, qualified meetings a month. So as you can imagine, the hit rate's pretty low. If you're doing 100 minutes on the, that's 500 minutes on the phone a day, uh, sorry, a week, pardon me. Um, and you're only booking, you know, three meetings a week out of that. That's a pretty poor return rate um, to get targeted on, which again, though, shows you how hard it can be to get a yes from a cold call, Um, especially considering I'm a snotty tech salesperson, probably got their number from Zoom Info or something like that. They probably weren't expecting it. You're going to get more no's than you are going to get yeses. Now, of course, you're going to find that unicorn, that person who has five minutes to chat, has, is struggling with their current solution and absolutely loves everything that you're selling to them. Um, but they are unicorns and they don't come along very often. So overcoming those no's is, is the hardest bit, to be perfectly honest with you. It's that resilience to, to, to get sworn at down the phone by a CFO which has happened to me several hundred, hundreds of times, um, it's to pick up the phone and go again, gather your thoughts, look at your research, whatever it is for your next prospect, and go again. Um, and I think without that absolute trench warfare that is, that, is, that is cold calling like that, there's no way that I would have been as successful as I am now. Um, and realistically, the only way that you can come out of the back of that is to just keep going. Because, I mean, I, I, an example for me, the first cold call I ever made, and this is in my first job, I, I hung up halfway through. 
just gave up. I couldn't couldn't get my words together. Made a little made a little noise and hung up the phone. Took myself outside for a cup of tea. What uh, what, what was the noise? Was it was it like a little? It was faint squeal, or it was a lot more of a, more of a squeak. You know, like you'd hear from like a mouse running away, like from some <laughs> from someone ch- from someone chasing it with a broom. Um, yeah, I was I, was, I I I got grilled a couple of times by the guy on the other end of the phone, and I made made this noise and just hung up. Move the move the lead out of my name in the CRM, uh, and uh, just sat there contemplating life for for five ten minutes. Like, what what on earth have I done? Um, but here I am, five years later, um, succeeding in a in a full cycle closing role. And as I said, without absolute failure right at the beginning, which is what that cold call was. Um, you don't, you can't learn. People don't learn from their, from their like successes. They learn from their failures. And every time that you mess up a cold call or you bungle an objection handle or you bungle a brush off, um, it only serves you better for the next time you pick up the phone. I was going to say, obviously you, um, sort of Facebook's mantra is fail often and fail fast, which is got like the same sort of methodology. If you've mm-hmm. just got to get on the phone and, you know, the person who gets the most no's also gets the most yeses, you know, all of those sort of cliche methodologies. But mm. what sort of um, tactic has worked well for you then over the years in terms of, right, you've had a really terrible call. Do you mm. just literally just draw a line, forget about it and move on? Do you analyze why it went wrong or do you leave that to a late, like how, how do you move on quickly? Yeah, I think it really depends, right? Because if you get one, if you, if, if one call goes really badly, you know, because as I, as we sort of said, of those umpteen calls you make in a day, you might only speak to five, six people. And that's probably being, being generous um, because that's just the nature of cold calling. Um, if, if one of those interactions goes poorly, you sort of just go again and hope for the best next time. If two of them go badly, maybe you reassess, am I doing the right research here? Um, what brush off am I, what, what, how am I handling their brush off? Because as I said, those unicorns who answer the phone and say, yeah, I've got time to talk. What do you want? Uh, don't come off and don't come around very often. Um, if they all go wrong, that is when you sort of take a, take a step back and consider and analyze and try to understand exactly what you're, where you're going wrong. Because realistically, as I said, but, um, realistically, you should be able to get an interaction out of that. But as I said, sales isn't a science because I could be pitching my product for someone who absolutely hates their current situation, can afford it, has the budget for it, and has the time to talk to me. But if I catch them just because they've like watched, like, I don't know, lost, lost a bet or something like that, like they've just look, look, looked at their paddy power and their accumulator on Lithuania basketball has gone wrong. Um, they're not going to talk to me, are they? Um, so it's about going back and understanding if that is the case, because as I said, it's not science, but then getting feedback from the people around you is so important, like call, call listening for argument's sake. We, in this job where I was sort of under the pump doing 100, 150 dials a day, we used to present a, like ever, like present a call each morning to listen to either one that went well or one that went badly just before we, before we got on the phones so we can have a chat about it to see, okay, this is what you did well. This is what you could have done better. Um, or conversely, this is where you went wrong here. Um, and this is what you should have said. Um, so I think that in order to be really, really successful in understanding why you fail, if you do, is using the people around you. Um, because whilst sales is by its very nature, an individual sport, if you will, um, I, I, I sort of, I guess you could say that being an account executive is like playing a, te- is being a tennis player and being a BDR is more like being a football player. Um, because realistically as a BDR or an SDR, you are invariably in, in the trenches with, with 10 other people just trying to get the, get the same thing out of it that you, as you are. Whereas as a, as an account executive, it's much more about your own, your own situation. Um, so using the people around you to understand where and why you're going wrong, seek it. Like if you're struggling, look at the guy who's doing well, put 50, like ask for 15 minutes in his calendar. How do you do this? How do you overcome that? Um, if you're the person succeeding, offer that help. Obviously, if, if, if you think that the person will take it to the person that isn't doing so well. 
um, I feel like it's much more of a, a collaborative effort because invariably, if you are in the office, which as lots of people are, obviously I'm not, um, it's so valuable to sort of feed off the other people on the phones, you know? Um, I feel that occasionally in our office, like there's one person cold calling at a time because everyone else is sort of focusing on their own thing. They're either pro like sort of lead sourcing or whatever, or doing a demo or whatever. If there's one person on the phone cold calling and getting getting smashed every single time by every single gatekeeper, every single decision maker, it's really, really palpable. Whereas if you all fail together, if you're all on the phone together um, and you, all, you each get smashed all at once, it almost becomes funny. Um, you know, whereas if you're getting absolutely pounded by a decision maker and everyone can hear it and it's just you, that is a very lonely place to be. Um, so that sort of feeding off the people around you and using your colleagues um, to help you succeed and to help everyone else succeed um, is something that I think is so fundamental to like a, to a successful BDR team, if you will, or a successful BDR function. And I guess, um, like coming out of university, uh, university again is a pretty, a, a single single player sport, right? You're you're there for yourself in terms of y your own degree. Um, so it, was that a learning curve in in the in that it was okay to fail as a team and th that embarrassment of sitting? Because uh, as a marketer, I sort of sit here and I think, God, I would hate to sit on a bank of um, 10 people and call next to someone and fail. Like, I would hate that, 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 that thought in my head is like anxiety to me. <laughs> so was that, a, was that a learning curve? That Was that a, a period that you had to kind of just get used to that? Yeah, hundred percent. Like um, for arguments, like in my third year of uni, I was in a, I was in a, a lecture. Uh, I, I studied law and for, for whatever reason, we were looking at some misgivings the BBC had about something quite inappropriate. And I was like, just scrolling on Facebook as a university student does when they're supposed to be listening to someone else, uh, clicked on a video and it was the video that made the sex noises and 300 people just sat there and laughed at me. Um, and obviously given what was on, on the screen in the lecture at the time, um, it wasn't received very well. And I was in like the second row. It wasn't received very well by the lecturer. Um, so going from that to, you know, six months, eight months later or summer later or whatever, um, getting told to F off on the other end of the phone by CFO and almost breaking down. And then it happening to the bloke next to me 10 seconds later, the sense of camaraderie that the sort of happened very, very quickly was a steep learning curve. But as with cold calling, as with failing, if you do it together, it makes it a lot easier. It's quite a normal thing, isn't it, for um, reps in sales to uh, to share their worst stories? 100%. 100%. Well, one, because you don't want to necessarily, I mean, obviously, if it's helpful, you'll share your successes, but you don't want to be that, be that guy who talks about all the amazing deals he's closed. You talk about the funny interactions you have with a decision maker where you, like, you accidentally swore at them or they swore back at you very, not very deliberately. Uh, or you squeaked and ran away, ran away from the phone as I did on my first one. Um, I feel like you learn, again, it's a cliche, but, you know, we're on a podcast, so why not? Um, you learn more from your failures as a BDR or as a sales rep um, than you do from your successes, 100%. Um, like, I mean, at the moment in the team, at, in the team that I sit on at, Re at Revolut, we're doing a deal study. Um, and I'm going to present something that recently went wrong for me, something what some like a deal that I dropped the ball on. Um, and hopefully that will help the people around me understand what not to do, because that is equally valuable, if not more so than the what to do element of sales, I would say. I was, um, I was speaking to um, someone called Lauren from snowflake and the the topic of active listening came up which is another like key skill i think that yeah. um reps sort of learn especially in the early days and the, you know notoriously i would say what graduates at that age probably some of the worst listeners um worst listeners there are out there so active listening then you, you you said you were listening to those around you but it's also listening to the person on the other end of the phone mm -hmm. like Tell us about that active listening uh, skill set then. Yeah, it's a it's a big uh, it's a big change in scenario, as you sort of said. Like so many graduates now go from 
their degree straight into sales thinking, oh, this will be sort of fine. I'll rock up and I get to get to go out for nice lunches and go on big team dues and things like that because that's what we shout about. That's what companies shout about on their uh, on their hiring pages. Um, but you forget that you've actually got to do the job um, at the same time. And active listening or sort of being considerate, if you will, is something that <clears throat> I have struggled with, certainly at the start. Probably even now, like no one's no one's perfect. Everyone has their their weak spots. Um, it is showing that consideration for the other person that you're talking to, um, validating what they're saying, appreciating what they're saying, consider considering the fact that actually I'm taking your time away from you, not vice versa. So it's 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 polite to start with, but also it's a very very key it's a very very key skill for being able to understand your prospects frame of mind, what make, what is important to them. Um, and active listening is obviously a huge part of that. Even if it's as something as simple as if you're, if we're on a call such as this, um, like just a, like a nod, like a sort of a, a murmur of agreement, things like that. Don't just sit there with a pen in your hand, writing notes, what they're saying on a, on a notebook or tapping away. Um, they're giving you their time. So just be polite. Yeah, it's um, it's a weird one because I think I, I, the majority of people would say that they're good listeners. Probably, well, almost all people would say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a great listener, really good listener. But uh, active listening is um, is uh, is another level of understanding, taking that information in, formulating a, a response that is, um, like you said, like an uh, a more considered educational or educated like feedback of i hear what you're saying i've put it through a my mind in terms of process and this is what comes out the other end in in terms of something that is constructive yeah act active listening is not hearing right it's not just hearing mm. the words that have been said to you um it is as you've just said using using those words to to improve the situation of the prospect because whilst no one will deny that people who work in sales are here to make money. If we can solve problems along the way, then surely that's a win-win. Invariably, you can't do the first one without first solving the problem um, because you won't close a deal unless you solve a problem. Um, and in order to solve a problem, you have to really understand what makes that prospect tick, what problems they're facing currently, um, and if your solution fits. Um, I think a, a big part of my sales growth, if you like, is a quick qualify out. Um, it's something that I never, ever, ever did starting out. I would never, ever, ever say, let's just pump the brakes. I don't think this is going to work. We're not the right fit. Um, thanks for your time. Carry on with your day. That was not something I would never, ever do. But active listening, as we've just said, using that information, digesting it, really understanding what the situation is um, will allow you to then potentially save time in your life by qualifying out because it's no good to anyone if you go through cold call, demo, more qualification, maybe another stakeholder comes in for a chat, you get them on board and realize, oh, hang on, this isn't a fit. Um, qualifying out is one of the most grown up things that you could do as a salesperson. And it's one of the hardest things, I think. Um, but you don't get to be able to do that without active listening. Yeah, I think because um, we, we spoke about um, emotional intelligence on the kickoff as well. And I think the emotional, that, that bit kind of speaks to emotional intelligence of, I mean, I'm, you go into sales thinking wrong or going into sales and it's, it's commission based and I'm, I, I need sales. I just need to get this mm -hmm. sale across the line. And I think uh, as you, um, grow as you learn as you get older your emotional intelligence um starts to improve in that like you said it's it's qualifying out is not, is not a bad thing yes okay you're not going to get commission off of that deal but in terms of that emotional intelligence you you've got the an understanding that it's not a right fit for them and you'll find something bigger and better down the line exactly like sales is so valuable to 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 everyone right Obviously, primarily to the person who is doing the selling, the seller, 
because you know it feeds their livelihood. Um, but also, I understand business so much better. And what I mean by that is how companies work. You know, the inner workings of tiny companies to you know pitching to enterprise companies as a BDR, like five hundred million plus turnover. Um, you don't get that without really, really considering whether it's the right fit. Um, the emotional intelligence required to cold call is 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 in, is incredible because emotional intelligence and resilience for me there's quite a lot of overlap um because if you get 15 20 no's in a row um when you're calling like you get a really good run of getting through gatekeepers getting put through but every single time the decision maker absolutely slams the phone down on you to have the emotional intelligence to take a step back take five minutes reset and go again is enormous um like there's a, obviously the cliche that sales sellers are very damaged people because we get said because people say no to us so much. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that is a cliche. I think it's absolutely 100 percent true. But you know we've got that emotional intelligence to get back up again. Um, could quote Rocky there, but again, I won't. So many opportunities for quoting films in this. This is really. A, this I, is please a, please this is... do. I, I'm, I I love a. We uh, there was an episode I did a few weeks back, and I think at the end of it, I uh, I had to apologise for the number of TV and movie quotes. <laughs> I think because there was just so many throughout that it was uh, yeah, it was almost too much. But yeah, go ahead. It's um, it's a, it's a quote from Rocky. My other half, when she listens to this, will will laugh because she says that my personality is entirely made up of television and film quotes, and none of it actually belongs to me. Um, but cold calling is, it's not about hard you hit. It's about hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Because as I said, that, that speaks so much to getting back up after getting 10 no's in a row, getting 15 no's in a row, not getting it, not getting through to anyone for two days, which is possible, you know? Um, and to have the emotional intelligence to turn things around, to get 10 no's in a row. And then that last call before lunch or that that call at 5.20 or 4.59 or whatever time you leave the office, um, grind out a meeting out of it. Um, it's so impressive. Like the guy that speaks to 15 people in a day, um, gets 14 no's and books a meeting with his last call, that is the most impressive person on the sales floor, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And again, it speaks to that sort of teamwork because your mate next to you will have watched you get absolutely binned all day um every single time you you get through to someone it's a no you're hopefully you might hear some success from them like there'll be a high five a fist bump whatever um like go and ring the bell if you book a meeting if that's if that's your company saying i mean i've had a bell i've had a gong things like that um it is that emotional intelligence to understand it's not it's not my fault sort of thing you know uh because as i've said three or four times sales isn't a science um you could pitch beautifully have a have the perfect solution but someone's just going to say no to you because they can't be bothered um so to have the emotional intelligence to understand that and give it another go tomorrow or the day after that um is something that is so fundamental and is so impressive about about sellers in general i think and i think in terms of um what was it 100 minutes on the phone as many dials as you need to make get 100 minutes on a phone or either or whatever time management right so to to stay on track with that 100 minutes or to stay on track with you know if you've got to do 40 or 50 dials or whatever time management must be a a massive massive um like portion of that we, we we've spoken a lot in the last few weeks about um sales reps becoming more like modern day project managers in that their a deal cycle is essentially a um, like a, a op, operational product uh, project in a business where you've got gantt charts and things and you have to mm. manage it most efficiently and so you can get it from the start to finish with the lowest cost highest success rate and as fast as possible or whatever so time management is um probably not something that from an outsider's perspective you would think oh yeah sales reps are great time manage managers but it's more and more so now like we're seeing that they they really are they have to be yes yeah, certainly they have to be um whether they are or they whether they are or not is another story and i am prime example of someone who has to work really hard at this because segmenting one's day and sort of prioritizing um is something that does not come necessarily naturally to me at all 
Um, like every single manager I've ever had would probably say that I do, I can do no work all day and then do sort of six hours of worth of work in an hour and a half at some point during the day. Um, being able to, to prioritize is something that's so fundamental, not just as a, a BDR, but even pro- potentially even more so as an account executive. Um, as a BDR, you've got to balance your, you know, your social selling. So you're like your LinkedIn um, with your lead sourcing, and then you're calling on the phone because to get a hundred minutes on the phone or whatever your target is for argument's sake, that's a lot of dials. Um, that's a lot of people who don't answer. That's a lot of people who, that's a lot of gatekeepers that fob you off. So being able to to segment one's day effectively enough to do that is something which is not which is which is which is not easy. And as you said, it's almost like if you're an AE, it's more of a, more of a project management perspective because you have to balance your your split function um, between your your BDR, your BDRing, so your your cold outreach, your lead sourcing, your calling, uh, your prospects that have already sort of need, have been cold called that need a demo, and obviously your existing cu- and your existing clients. If you are that three hundred and sixty person who account manages as well, um, you're almost doing potentially the work of three people um, under one target. And if you cannot successfully or efficiently segment your day, um, you're going to struggle and struggle quickly. <clears throat> I think, and I am one of those people who the main thing that I say, I, I think I would say that I've changed in my almost 18 months in this job is really being really, really disciplined about my calendar. Um, I've got my lead sourcing time. I've got my calling time. I've got my account management time. I've got my off time. I have, a, I have lunch in my calendar every day um, so that that's sort of my time. Um, I have blocks, as I said, for lead sourcing, things like that. And if it's not something that comes naturally to you, that's the only way that you're going to do it. Like forcing yourself to segment um, because you are essentially doing the job of what, between one and three people um, at once. And then for you, you said for you, that's deep. Like I call them deep work blocks. I do the same mm-hmm. thing where I, I like nine till 12, I've got a deep work block for podcast mm-hmm. or something, mm-hmm. or I've got a deep work block for website work and that's mm. blocked out of my calendar i do that at the start of the week so mm. nothing can disrupt that and i know that I, like you said you in terms of where your head's at you're like right that those that two hour block all i'm doing mm. is that is is that how you do it exactly yeah, yeah. so on my calendar is I, I do it slightly differently um so rather than doing if if we say i've got three three functions to fulfill i've got outbound prospecting bdring uh, demoing and closing and account management. If I say I've got those three prongs of what my job is, um, I would I do a bit of every single one of those every day. Um, so for argument's sake, every single day between three and five p.m. at the moment, what's working for me is that's when I do my prospecting, my lead sourcing, um, and getting enough people to contact. Um, I have two hours a day of calling, outbound um, or outbound prospects, outbound contacts in some way or another. Normally that's split an hour of calling, an hour of like LinkedIn or email or something. Um, and then I have an hour, 45 minutes, I think it's 45 minutes actually at the moment of account management in my calendar um, every day. Because, you know, if, if you are in that full cycle where you don't hand over to a CSM or an account manager, um, you can't forget about that because you do too much account management, you won't bring in enough new meetings. You do too many. You, too, you, you book too many meetings. You don't have, or you try to book too many meetings. You don't have enough time to look after the clients that you already have on board, who you could be missing out on, really, really getting the most out of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, it's that that's the hardest part of my job is segmenting those sort of three priorities. Uh, we've um yeah we we had a uh, one of our own SDRs who came on um and shared his calendar that's um he introduced at the start of the year that was working well for him and it's yeah a similar sort of thing where he he knows the key tasks he's he's got to do in order to keep the pipeline moving and he mm-hmm. does a little bit of that every day so yeah it's definitely one um worth thinking about if you don't do it already um now I I was thinking you come across as a extremely confident guy uh, as do most sales reps do you think that um, on the whole, most sales reps are confident because of their their job in that they've had, like you said, they've had 
or they've been battered um, mm. over and over and over and over again, which means they've become more resilient. And then over time, they become confident in their abilities because of the um, because they've stuck it out and they've continued. So, do, do, do you think it's a confidence builder working in sales? Hundred percent. Like, I mean, I work. Obviously, I did a law degree at uni, which is reasonably like you have to present, you have to talk a lot to people. Um, I worked in bars for most of the time that I was at, at uni and slightly before, slightly after. Um, so talking to loads of people every day, I was like, oh yeah, this is great. I can definitely go and do sales. I can sling cocktails around the bar and talk rubbish to people um, for six, seven hours a night. I can definitely go and work in sales because it's basically the same thing, right? It's not basically the same thing, right? Um, my sort of confidence in what I do has been born out of one working to see what works for me two failing um and i mean that both in sort of more micro fails so messing up a cold call or getting sworn out down the phone and i'm like more large scale fails like you know not succeeding in a job because you know it wasn't right for me um and i think that those that those things is really what have created the person that i am now from a professional perspective um, as I said, like I did two as a as a university student or a, someone going into sales. Really, if you if you think about the cliches that people that, that people make about what job you should do if you want to go into sales or recruitment or something, go and work behind a bar or go and be a waiter or something like that because it gives you people skills. Um, it's a completely completely different kettle of fish. Um, and I. And prime example of someone who made the mistake of thinking that they'd just walk sales because, you know, they had sort of the, the right background, if you will. Um, but yes, yeah, several failures have led me to be where I am today. Like, I actually cannot explain how many times, you know, like I've, I've moved jobs a lot over the last few years until I finally found one that I was settled in and succeeded in. Um, and sometimes it does take that that failure because to me that's failure um you know not sticking in a job for more than i don't know six seven months and then binning it off because you got offered an, like a higher salary somewhere else that's failure um because if in a sales function if you were really succeeding you wouldn't need that um and i have failed several times um but that confidence that i have now would not exist at all had i not done that yeah, no, I think we we've discussed it on um, well, pretty much th- throughout the fifty nine episodes we've done, like on and off, we've talked about how sales is one of the best um, sort of functions to go into to actually develop young uh, like graduates in terms of it's either going to make or break you. Like, you, the, mm-hmm. like yes, the the resilience of being battered and getting back up um, again for some it just really isn't for them and they never mm-hmm. go back to sales. But for those that are able to stick it out, it does. Um, it's it's certainly one of the best functions for developing score kills, uh, skill sets and making you a more direct, a more um, integral part of any business moving forward, like 100%. Well, yeah, as, as, I, as I said, right, earlier on, sales teaches you so much about how companies work. Um, and I now know sort of my value proposition, if you like, for several verticals because I understand how their business works. And there's no way that I could have learned about how company type A work and company type B work had I not cold called their CFO or CEO or MD or whoever it happens to be um, and and spoken to them for a couple of minutes about it or done the, done the research, if you will, preparing for that cold call, even if I never got through or never got, you never got a decent conversation out of someone. Um, you have to learn so much about so many different industries that even if sales doesn't end up being for you, um, it gives you such a clear idea about what could be right for you because you've dipped your toe really into so much. Yeah. Now we'll, um, we'll, we'll spend the last 10 minutes doing some like more short snappy tips, the okay. sort of takeaways. Um, mm-hmm. So what would you say are the um, most valuable skills that you learn as a BDR that you've taken through to an AE? Uh, I don't know, give three, five, whatever you want to do. Yeah, sure. I think the first one is the resilience. Uh, again, the the skill is so transferable um, from BDR to AE because at BDR level, the resilience you have to show is picking up the phone again or doing that, that next round of lead sourcing 
whereas the resilience that you have to show as an AE um, is, you know, a deal might go south. Some of they might pull out for, they might go with a competitor and you have to learn from that and get up and go again. Um, invariably, if you lose it out to a competitor, you haven't qualified well enough um, or you, weren't, you just weren't the right fit in the first place. So again, it's that resilience to understand, evaluate and then move on. Um, the next one I would say is one that we've touched on, which is, which is active listening. Um, as, a, as a BDR, if you're not actively understanding, taking in, showing empathy, um, there's no way you're going to be, be going to be able to handle the objection that you've just been presented with. Um, and that skill is exactly the same in BDR as it is in A, um, because realistically, you're going to get objections potentially at demo level um, that you will have to give a considered response to. And if you haven't really understood it, there's no way you're going to be able to handle it effectively. Um, and I guess the third one that I would say is possibly the most important is knowing the difference between a brush off and an objection um, because they're not the same thing. And knowing the difference stands you in such, such good stead going into your closing role um, that it allows you to, to understand what is the difference and what is the difference, I suppose. So a brush off to me is someone saying, no, not interested, haven't got time, just a, just a way to get you off the phone. Um, if you get one of these, then that is the most difficult part of a cold call to overcome for me because objections are trainable. Yeah, realistically, you will know what objections are going to come up on a, on a cold call or on a demo. So you can train for those. Um, you can sort of rehearse answers for objection handling. Brush off is a much more raw, um, is a much more raw interaction. So being able to sidestep a brush off into the rest of the cold call is the hardest part of the job, in my opinion, um, in terms of the physical cold call, um, because it's not tangible. It's just that they can't be bothered at the moment or it's a cold call, so they automatically their, their, their default response is to hang up the phone. Um, so yeah, I think those three is, those those three things are, are are the most important that I would take from one role to the other. And, and what about um, top three cold calling tips in general, rather than moving from from BDR through to AE? Just cold calling in general, three top things that you've you've learned. Yeah, I think the first one is. I'm going to sort of headline this by most of them involve around um, sort of emotional intelligence. Um, so either that's internal emotional intelligence or sort of more consideration for sort of the wider, the wider situation. The first one is do your research. Um, your three by three, whatever you want to call it. Um, Cause when you are on the phone to someone, you're taking time out of their day. You're trying to convince them this conversation with Patrick is more important than the key business function that I'm responsible for in my company. Um, and if you haven't done your research, you're not only wasting your own time, you're more importantly wasting theirs. And realistically, your first impression is absolute shot. Um, the second one is be considerate. Um, and this, again, speaks to sort of active listening um, as well. Um, it builds your credibility to start with because being considerate to your prospects shows that you're not a robot. You're not just a droid who is in a, not that this is a slight to anyone, but it's the perception that it has like in a call center trying to spam them. Um, this helps handle brush offs as well, because if you're considerate, someone says, oh, now's not a good time. Um, you know, it might not be a good time. Like I, at the start of my cold calling career was probably guilty of just bulldozing this. And being like, oh, can't you just spare a couple of minutes? Come on, it'll only take a couple of minutes. Um, that would be a complete turn off for me if I got a cold call like that. Um, if I've been polite enough to be like, look, mate, not at the moment, but maybe try again. Show consideration. Qualify when's good because that's just being good at your job. Um, but show that consideration. Um, and finally, be, cons be persistent. And this is sort of persistence in two parts, like general persistence which is what we've sort of spoken about with like resilience, getting back up when you're down, 
Um, but pick up the phone. If things go wrong, the quickest way to remedy a bad, a bad cold call is to have a good one. The quickest way to forget an absolute calamity is to book a meeting. Um, if you have five dreadful calls and then book a massive meeting, no one will remember the bad calls, the bad, the bad calls that you made. Um, get feedback, as we've said, like do call listening. The people around you are your most valuable tool. Um, and finally, don't be afraid to fail. Um, as I said, I've learned so much more from my failures than I have from my successes. Being able to come out the other side of those will make you better at, as a BDR. And then if it's the, the route that you take, will make you better as a closer as well. I was just going to add on that um, don't be afraid to fail thing. I think something I've learned over the years is when I was younger and I, I failed, I tried to cover it up. I tried to hide it. I tried mm. to avoid it. I tried to park it in the back of my brain, lock the door and never think about it. Um, in the past, it was, you know, oh, can I can I get away with that failure? Can mm. I keep hush hush about it? And my manager won't find out and we'll just move on to next month and it'll be great. Don't do that. Be mm. open, be honest, address it or take it on like head first, up front, just you failed, hold your hands up and, and move on. Just don't, don't try and um, make excuses for yourself. How, however you, you know, would do that. I think that's one thing I would add to that. Um, Cause failing is, is one thing, but actually, um, I don't know, acknowledging the failure is a, is a different ball game altogether, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, in the professional world, if you fail and don't analyze afterwards, then you will be exposed very, very quickly. Um, because when your boss comes to you and says, oh, what's, what's, why is this not working? What's going wrong for you? And you say, I don't know, I'm just, it's just not going well. That's not really a good enough answer. Um, if you can say, look, I've been trying this at the moment. It's not really working. Um, I think this is why. Fine. How are you going to address that? Okay, I'm going to go after a different vertical. I'm going to try a different um, opener on my cold call. Um, I'm going to try and handle their brush off in a slightly in a slightly more considerate or a slightly more assertive way, whichever one is is not working for you at the moment. Because cold calls can go one of two ways: you can be too timid and get walked all over when it could be a good opportunity, or as I am probably get, have been guilty of in the past and potentially still am, you can be too bolshy and try and barge into their slot, um, like barge into their time um, when you should be being more reserved and more considerate. Um, so yeah, it's about giving accountability, like being accountable to yourself, but also the people around you and understanding how you can improve. Um, if if um, anyone's listening to this, wants to upskill, wants to get better at cold calling outside of actually doing it over and over and over and over and over again, are there any um, YouTube videos, any podcasts, any books mm. that you've read that were, were good? So uh, not particularly any of those however there is a methodology that is done by a like a sales company that's not an ad it's just we i've been trained by them before and it's it's what i use to this day um i think they're called factor eight um and the methodology is called swift and it stands for so what's in it for them um and it's about understanding what can the prospect or the the potential client get out of this five minute interaction like what, what information can I give them that will improve them going forward? Um, so that is one methodology that works for me. It's what I use all the time. Um, so that is one that I would certainly look into Swift, S-W-I-I-F-T. Interesting. Yeah, yeah no worries. I, I think um, we, we always have, um, we always like to share, even if it's other podcasts, other stuff. Mm. So I think, yeah, go and, go and check that out. I'm definitely going to go and check it out because I've not heard of it. And I think mm. um, it could be one for uh, me to get on the podcast mm. and the guys yeah, are guys at factor eight so um one last question um podcast and nominate who do i need to get on the podcast next and why so um he's probably gonna absolutely despise me for doing this but uh john dixon um he's a very very good friend of mine um he works at softcat which is the first company i joined he is yeah, uh, right, yeah. he's a collaboration specialist and he's the, the sort of the new proposition owner um amazing at his job really really lovely bloke um and he's a gooner as well we have season tickets and we go together um, so if he comes on this podcast, I can give him stick as he will give me stick, no doubt, when he listens to this. Brilliant. I'll um I'll, I'll follow up after and um yeah we'll we'll get that chat going and see if we can get him on. Um, but yeah, sounds good, sounds good. Right, look, I I appreciate you jumping on. We we've just gone over the uh, the midday, so I am eating into your lunch, so I'm very conscious of that. So um yeah, thanks for coming on. I hope I hope that those listening or watching have found it valuable. If they have, or if you have, please um, follow, subscribe, 
um, to the podcast. Also give it a like on YouTube, um, weekly releases, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next episode. But um, thanks again. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me.